Hello everyone and greetings again from MedTube for another video on ECGs about bundle branch blocks. Now if you notice here I didn't mention the title abnormal cardiac rhythms because in bundle branch blocks the rhythm of the heart actually remains a normal sinus regular rhythm. Unlike the previous heart blocks which we have already discussed there were also sinus rhythms i.e. originating from the SA node but they were not normal as most of them had an irregular pattern well except for first degree heart blocks which were actually regular so bundle branch blocks now bundle branch blocks could be divided into four main categories the first category is left bundle branch blocks left anterior fascicular blocks the third is left posterior fascicular blocks and the fourth and the last one is right bundle branch blocks or you could have a combination of those so let's start with left bundle branch blocks. Left bundle branch blocks are characterized by the following on an ECG. First, you have an M pattern of the QRS complex in the lateral leads, leads 1, AVL, V5, and V6. We have a deep S wave in V1. And we'll see shortly why we have an M pattern in the deep S wave. We have absent Q waves in the lateral leads, leads 1, V5, and V6, but not AVL. We have ST segment and T wave inversion in the lateral leads again, but that's not always. Sometimes it's present, sometimes it's not. We have a broad QRS complex, as we have said in the previous video, because of intraventricular con conduction delay. And we have a left axis deviation, as we will be seeing why now. So here on this slide, we can see the characteristic findings of left bundle branch block on this, on this drawing here. But First, let's review some points on the conduction pathway in, the, in order to understand what really happens. So, first point is that when you have a left bundle branch block right here, you get, you're going to have all the conduction waves be forced to travel through the right bundle branch. And since we need the left ventricle to operate, of course, the electrical, uh, the electrical potentials will be forced to travel from the right ventricle, from the right bundle branch, towards the left ventricle. Therefore, the average direction of all the depolarization waves will be going to the left eventually. Therefore, you have a left axis deviation on an ECG. The second point is that the intraventricular septum, the IVS, is normally activated from the left side to the right side, owing to the uh, thicker left bundle branch and the fact that most of the intraventricular septum is located within the left ventricle, therefore activated by the left bundle branch. But in left bundle branch block, the IVS will be forced to be activated from the right side to the left side, reaching the left ventricle. Therefore, when the, uh, when the IVS is depolarized, you're going to have the first R wave. And since the depolarization wave is moving to the left ventricle, towards V6, and V6 is of course looking at the left ventricle, so since it's moving towards V6, you're going to have an upward deflection, and that's the first R wave, representing IVS depolarization. And then you have an S wave, and that represents the normal right ventricular depolarization, because the right ventricle at this point is normally depolarizing, depolarizing and therefore you have the small R wave in V1, and the small S wave in V6. And then the last thing you're going to have is the depolarization of the left ventricle. And when the left ventricle is depolarizing, you're going to have the second R wave, which is called as an R prime. And you're going to have, and since it is taking a long time, you're going to have a deep S wave in V1. Remember, R waves in V6 and S waves in V1 represent the left ventricle. Whereas... S waves in V6 and R waves in V1 represent the right ventricle. So in summary, it's important to understand that in bundle branch blocks, the ventricles are activated sequentially and not simultaneously. In a case of a left bundle branch block, the right ventricle is first activated and then the left ventricle is activated. One last point important to note is that the R prime wave, which is the second R, is taller than the first R wave and it's also commonly known as the right rabbit ear for the R prime and the left rabbit ear for the first R and the, ra the right rabbit ear which is the R prime is taller than the left in bundle branch blocks 
and we'll see in the next videos why that is really really clinically important to know here on this slide we have a characteristic ECG of a left bundle branch block so let's look at the lateral leads let's pick up here V6 we can see first the M pattern the R S R prime pattern of the QRS complex and with the R prime being longer than the R wave which is characteristic for left bundle branch block we can also see an absent Q wave in the lateral leads and we can also see an ST segment depression and T wave inversion though it's not necessarily available we can also see T wave inversions in leads 1 and AVL now you don't necessarily need to have an M shape of the QRS but it could be just notched or monophasic but it's important to have the two R waves you can also see a wide QRS complex at the base more than three small squares which means it's a complete left bundle branch block not an incomplete one you can also see a deep broad S wave in V1 and V2 which are looking at the right ventricle and lastly you can see a left axis deviation which is leads one looking lead one is looking upwards whereas leads two or three and AVF are facing downwards this is left axis deviation left bundle branch block is particularly important to pick up because a new left bundle branch block could be a sign of acute myocardial infarction whereas a pre-existing left bundle branch block could actually mask the signs of an acute myocardial infarction and both for both reasons left bundle branch blocks are important to pick up and now with the second bundle branch block which is called the anterior fascicular block also known as the left anterior hemi block and it's characterized by the following we have small Q waves and tall R waves in one and AVL we have small R waves and deep S waves in two three AVF we have a normal QRS complex and we have a left axis deviation and pretty much all changes here follow the same concept of the changes in the left bundle branch block which means you have a block at some point and the other point which is normal and functioning is trying to compensate for the non-conductive part and therefore you have these ACG changes if you look at ACG here for the left anterior fascicular block we have small Q waves and tall R waves in what leads one and AVL whereas we have small R waves and deep S waves in 2, 3, AVF and we have a left axis deviation leads 1 is looking upwards 2, 3, AVF looking downwards left axis deviation and now with the third type of bundle branch blocks which is the left posterior fascicular block and it's as characterized by pretty much the opposite findings of left anterior fascicular block which are small R waves and deep S waves in one and AVL unlike the two three AVF in the left anterior fascicular block we have a small Q waves and the tall R waves in two three AVF unlike the one in AVL in the left anterior fascicular block we have a normal QRS complex and we have a right axis deviation here we have a typical ECG of a left posterior fascicular block so you can see here we have small R waves and deep S waves in leads 1 and AVL whereas we have small Q waves and tall R waves in leads 2, 3 and AVF and lastly we have a typical right axis deviation lead 1 is facing downwards whereas leads 2, 3 and AVF are facing upwards uh, this is a typical left posterior fascicular block however it is important that to know that left posterior fascicular blocks are quite uncommon therefore we have first to rule out other causes of right axis deviation such as acute pulmonary embolism, right ventricular hypertrophy, lateral MI, etc because left posterior fascicular block is uncommon the second thing it's quite rare to have this kind of block in isolation because usually it occurs with a right bundle branch block which is what we call as bifascicular block and now we come to the last bundle branch block which is the right bundle branch block and the right bundle branch block is pretty much the opposite of left bundle branch block so we have that M shape of the QRS complex in V1 and V2 usually because they're facing the right ventricle we have the broad S wave in the lateral leads 
We could also have ST depression and T wave inversion in the V1 and V2, which are facing the right ventricle, but this is not necessarily available. We have a broad QRS complex, but we have a normal cardiac axis, and this is the reason. So here we have the conduction pathway. So we have a right bundle branch block. So the rest of the depolarization waves will be forced to go through the left bundle branch. And of course, the depolarization waves will eventually reach the right ventricle through the left ventricle. But the average direction of the waves of the whole heart remains unchanged because most of the depolarization waves are actually conducted via the thick left bundle branch to the thick left ventricle and only a small amount of depolarization waves will be spreading to the right ventricle to the right side therefore the cardiac axis remains unchanged and you do not have a right axis deviation in right bundle branch block and here on this drawing here we have the characteristic right bundle branch block findings RSR pattern this, again the the right rabbit ear is taller than the left rabbit ear and this is in V1 whereas in V6 we have a broad S wave representing the ventricular depolarization of the right ventricle here on this slide we have a characteristic ECG of right bundle branch block first we can see the RSR prime pattern in V1 V2 and V3 if we have a wide QRS complex all over the ECG and we have a broad slurred S wave in V5 and V6 and actually here we can also see it in one and AVL which is characteristic for right bundle branch block and you can also notice that the the cardiac axis is still normal everything one two and AVF are facing upwards here we have an ECG of also right bundle branch block, but pretty much the only difference is that you have a narrow QRS complex. Therefore, we call it here as an incomplete right bundle branch block. Right bundle branch block could look similar to a condition known as Brogata syndrome. Brogata syndrome is a life-threatening condition because it could result in sudden death. And therefore, it's very important to pick up. Brigada syndrome is characterized by a coved ST elevation followed by T wave inversion in V1, V2, and V3. So the, the primary difference is that you have an ST elevation. But to make a complete diagnosis of Brigada syndrome, you have to meet the following criteria. You have a coved shaped ST elevation of more than 2 millimeters in more than one of V1 to V3 plus inverted T wave plus one of the following clinical criteria to diagnose Brugada syndrome. Here we have the classic Brugada sign, ST elevation plus T wave inversion. Do not be tricked, this is not RSR prime pattern, but it's Brugada sign. And remember, both the RSR prime pattern seen in right bundle branch block and the Brugada sign are seen in V1 to V3. So be careful to differentiate between them. And this is the last slide about bifascicular block. Usually, bifascicular block is the block of right bundle branch plus the left anterior fascicle. But it could be also right bundle branch block plus left posterior fascicular block, but it's less common. Here on this ECG, we have right bundle branch block plus left anterior fascicular block. And this is how we read it. First, you can see the RSR pattern in V1, V2, and V3. We have a wide QRS complex, suggesting it's a complete right bundle branch block, and we have the T wave inversion in V1 and V2. Plus, we have the small Q wave and the tall R wave in leads 1 and AVL. Plus, we have the small R waves and the deep S waves in leads 2, 3, AVF. Plus, we have left axis deviation. Lead, lead 1 is upwards, whereas 2, 3, and AVF are downwards. So all of those are left anterior fascicle block, plus the right bundle branch block here makes the diagnosis of a bifascicular block. This concludes our video about bundle branch blocks, and hopefully we see you in the next video with regular tachycardias. Thank you very much.